Here's the noble dream of minimum competency testing. A reasonable standard is set, a hurdle that every child must leap before earning a credential. You want that high school diploma? You have to master this basic material. You have to demonstrate your competency in reading and math. No more goofing off in bogus electives. No more social promotion. No more moving kids on to the next grade, even if they flunked. No more kids falling through the cracks. For employers, no more high school graduates, diplomas in hand, who can't even calculate fractions or write a cogent memo. In many ways, this idea of minimum competency testing is a bridge between the imperatives of equality and excellence in education. How could it possibly go wrong? The answer is in many ways. To understand some of them, let's take a look at one particular example of minimum competency testing out in the field. The case study of North Carolina, which instituted a program of minimum competency testing in the late 1970s. It was an early example of high stakes testing, and at least one education historian has noted North Carolina's shift in the late 1970s towards minimum competency testing as part of the turn from civil rights and equality in education policy towards this idea of accountability and excellence in education policy. Now one thing to think about in this video is this notion of accountability, which is something that sounds great in theory, but something that is often a little slippery when you actually try to figure out who is being held accountable for what. When we talk about education policy in particular, is it the student who's being held accountable, the parent, the teacher, the school, the state, the society at large? That's something to think about as we talk about minimum competency testing here in North Carolina in the 1970s. In this case, the central champion of minimum competency testing was the then Lieutenant Governor James B. Hunt, or Jim Hunt. Now, Hunt was running for governor, and he saw minimum competency testing as something that could be a key part of his education platform. He said that he wanted these tests to restore public faith in education after the trauma of desegregation. Now, why might this have seemed to be good politics for Hunt? The context here is that desegregation is something that had just come to pass, and it was a process that was still being worked out in much of North Carolina. I mean, in fact, it's a process that's still very much being worked out, and we've seen the resegregation of much of our school systems, but that's a topic for another time. During the 1970s, many whites were still coming to terms with the fact that they were attending desegregated schools, resenting the, what they perceived as a decline in quality. Meanwhile, many African Americans were starting to become a little more jaundiced about this process of desegregation. It had meant the closing of many cherished black institutions, and it had meant the firing and demotion of many highly qualified teachers and principals in black schools. Hunt thought that minimum competency testing could help restore faith in public schools and support for those schools in people both white and black, people who had their kids in school, and those who were just paying taxes. The idea here is that you could use these tests to show parents that your kids are all right. They're learning a lot in these schools. It's okay to stay in the public school system. Meanwhile, you can show taxpayers that, look, your tax money is going to good work here, teaching these students all these new skills that are quantified by these exams. Now, Hunt won the 1976 election, and the next year he persuaded the legislature to pass a program very similar to the one he campaigned on. A 15-member testing commission was given the task of devising the tests in reading and math which were considered obvious academic survival skills, and they would be administered in the 11th grade starting in the fall of 1978. Students would have up to 10 tries, but if they never passed the tests, even if they did everything they were supposed to do in order to graduate, they would get a certificate instead of a diploma. In this scheme, it was the students who were being held accountable. Hunt proclaimed, it's really a matter of honesty. We've got to stop cheating young people, pretending that they have learned what they haven't. The test should make students better citizens and help students get the good, high-paying jobs now coming to our state. Hunt, at that time, was trying to move North Carolina away from the old traditional industries of textiles and furniture and tobacco and towards more lucrative, high-paying jobs in microelectronics or biotechnology. Now, some folks feared, with good reason, that this testing program would perpetuate the ill effects of segregation. North Carolina's program was modeled in part on a similar minimum competency testing program in Florida, which had started the year before in North Carolina. 
In those tests, about 37% of all 11th graders in the state of Florida failed. But that rate was much higher for African Americans at around 75%. Black plaintiffs challenged the tests in court, arguing that they shouldn't punish older cohorts for educational failings they had suffered under the older segregated order. In 1979, Florida courts sided with the plaintiffs, saying that the state couldn't deny diplomas until the taint of the dual system of education had been completely eliminated. This controversy had given minimum competency testing a bit of a bad rap. After studying Florida's system, the esteemed National Academy of Education proclaimed that any setting of statewide minimum competency standards for awarding the high school diploma is basically unworkable, exceeds the present measurement arts of the teaching profession, and will create more social problems than it can conceivably solve. That's bureaucratic speak for, this is a dumb idea. Now the Haunt administration was not blind to this criticism of minimum competency tests. To address some of them, it decided to administer a test exam in the spring of 1978 to help iron out some of these kinks. The testing commission, which included at least a few African American representatives, tried to factor out cultural bias in the exams. The state also earmarked additional remediation money so that students who failed the exam wouldn't be hung out to dry. Remediation money was also helpful in that it appeased educators at schools with higher proportions of disadvantaged students. Now, the first tests that counted were administered in the fall of 1978. And the results were pretty good, at least compared to Florida. In North Carolina, about 90% of students passed the reading exam, while about 85% passed the math exam. Now, Hunt emphasized that these results were still not good enough, and he used that to push for even more money for the school system. By 1980, 99% of white students had passed the exam, and about 89% of black students were doing so. Hunt tried to use these numbers to declare victory for the power of accountability and remediation. But much of the press wasn't having it. The editor of the Greensboro Record said that the test was so easy it was, alas, meaningless. The News and Observer was even more pointed in an editorial in December 1980. The test is only the bearer of the bad news. That only 2% of seniors in North Carolina failed may say more about this state's test than the successes of the school system. A competency test does embrace certain values, that knowledge is better than ignorance and that being able to read and compute is better than not. Any school system that does not share these values is no more than a human warehouse in which students pass their time on their way to becoming unemployed and unemployable adults. Moreover, the attention to cultural bias and the greater passing numbers didn't preclude lawsuits in North Carolina. In May 1980, about 3,000 black children in North Carolina were going to be denied diplomas. But a group of plaintiffs, represented by famed civil rights attorney Julius Chambers, filed a lawsuit to stop the denial of their diplomas. North Carolina defended itself by arguing that this was actually supposed to help address the insidious effects of segregation by identifying those deficient in order to boost their ability to function in society. Eventually, the lawsuit was dropped, and some civil rights leaders came around with some lukewarm support for the testing program. But nevertheless, many doubts remained among African Americans about the purpose of these minimum competency tests. Finally, these tests raise a whole can of worms for the parents of children today we might call learning disabled, although back then they were officially called mentally retarded. Special education funding had just come through in recent years, and we were starting to see many special ed students reintegrated into the mainstream classroom after decades of being shunted aside into either special schools or just not taught in schools altogether. Now with minimum competency testing, many parents of learning disabled students were feeling like the rug was being pulled out from them yet again. Their children struggled in many respects to pass these tests. And so instead of getting a full diploma, they were getting these certificates instead. Now North Carolina wasn't the only state to adopt minimum competency testing. And Many of them did it in the late 1970s and early 1980s. It was part of this broader movement of education reform. But they weren't the silver bullets that many reformers had hoped they would be. Depending on your point of view, they were either too easy or too hard. They weren't testing the right thing. Many wondered if it made sense to hold students accountable rather than parents or teachers or schools or society. 
In North Carolina, perhaps the most important public policy failing for our purposes is that it didn't solve the political riddles that Jim Hunt hoped it would solve. It didn't shore up his political coalition, and it didn't restore faith in public schooling either. In the early 1980s, increasingly, Hunt moved away from talking about minimum competency testing and instead focused on new pet projects like merit pay for science and math teachers or a residential high school for particularly gifted students in science and math. Still, even though minimum competency testing fell to the background rather than the foreground of public policy, the idea that high stakes testing could be a bridge between excellence and equality continued to be a theme across the country, but particularly in North Carolina. And that's something we'll pick up in other videos.